This is Talking Technology. I'm Gary Barker. And I'm Leon Gitlow. And this is episode two in our series for 2013. And we have an absolutely fascinating interview with Ruslan Kogan, the online retailer, Leon. Uh, listen, Gary, this interview is an absolute cracker. And if you are planning to set up an online retail business, listen to this interview because he will tell you how it's done. Let's not forget that in a space of just six years or so, he has built this company into a turnover of $250 million. He's looking in the future to have a turnover of $1 billion. It's extraordinary as he talks about the technology that he uses to build up the company and he i mean this isn't only this isn't these aren't counter jumpers that he employs he's got statisticians he's got researchers all to, the staff in there is big and it's expert and listen if you think being an online retailer means just sitting around and looking at your computer you got another thing coming listen to him as he talks about the detail that they need to go into the granularity of how much research is needed it's extraordinary and here he is Ruslan Kogan, the, you're very successful in online. You have a big business, a global business. The technology behind what you're doing, can you describe how you started and how you developed? And you must have a very large digital IT back, background now supporting you. So my entire background is IT and technology. I put together my first computer when I was nine years old. I studied business systems at university. I finished top of the state in IT in high school. So I've always been into IT, into technology and had a passion uh, for computing. Uh, so that, that's a big background of mine and it's a core part of what we do at Kogan. One thing a lot of th- people don't understand about online retailers and technology businesses is they think that all of our advantage comes from the fact that we don't have bricks and mortar stores and they think that we just sit in our office on NetBank all day clicking refresh Uh, but there's a lot more to it than that the whole business is driven by technology so when the business has started uh, it's important to keep things simple you want to have the right processes in place correct collecting the right information, uh, manipulating that information in the right way for whatever records and data you need to keep and uh, make sure everyone's informed from customers to warehouses and emails going out and all of that. Uh, As Kogan has grown and we've gone from, you know, doing $300,000 worth of turnover in our first year, six years ago, to $250 million. So we've grown 750 times or more. Uh, obviously you need to scale a lot of your systems when you're doing all of that so um, everything becomes a challenge Uh, for instance it's very easy to run a website that gets 500 hits a day but to run a website that gets 150,000 unique visitors a day becomes a whole different ball game. Uh, you need to have servers that are scalable. You need to scale out to uh, multiple servers. You need to have load balancers in place. You need to do all sorts of caching. You need to use content delivery networks to distribute images and uh, rich media to wherever it's been demanded from the most. So for instance, uh, if we're noticing spikes of traffic in Corefield in Melbourne, our our algorithms and servers will automatically position certain images and big files at ISP locations around Corefield to ensure that the amount of lag time necessary for that image to load on the person's computer is minimal. You know, so as the business grows, you you learn to do all of these things and you have to do all of these things. So, um, you know, things like that become crucial. Then, for instance, uh, when the business started, our newsletter subscription database would have been a few hundred people. To send an email to a few hundred people, yeah, that's pretty easy. You just put them in the BCC field on an email, you type out the email and you click send. When your database grows to a million people, that becomes a whole different ballgame. Once again, you need distributed servers, you need dedicated servers processing the emails, you need to do uh, all sorts of verification and authentication on the server side to ensure that the ISPs around the world don't see you as a spammer and things like that. And it becomes, you know, there's a lot of challenges involved in all of that because a typical email server can send a few messages a second. Now, if you've got a million people you need to send an email to, that's going to 
might take over 24 hours at that rate. So you need to introduce distributed servers and then you need to ensure that deliverability happens quickly. So with our architecture in place right now, we can click a button and have a message go out to a million people in less than five minutes, which is extremely important when you're running a lot of deals on your site and things like that. Like we'll sometimes have a special on a product and that product sells out within a few hours. It's unfair if some people receive that email, you know, 12 hours after the deal goes live. So you need everyone getting it at the same time. So that's just two examples out of probably a hundred examples of how technology drives the business. And then behind all this, you need a warehousing inventory systems and all of that, don't you? Yeah, you need sales records management systems, you need inventory systems, you need supply chain systems, uh, you need systems for every bit of the business, you need systems that control the sourcing, you need systems that control your online advertising, your bid management, ensuring that you're putting ads in the right place, ensuring that your banner ads are distributed to the right content network. So uh, every little bit of the business you look at, there is sophisticated systems in the background making it work. So this is a lot tougher than bricks and mortar in many ways, isn't it? Definitely. It's uh, different challenges, I'd say. You know, uh, bricks and mortar has its challenges and stuff that I would know nothing about. I know nothing about negotiating a lease agreement in a shopping centre. You know, I know nothing about that, but I do know a lot about IT and systems and there are two totally different skill sets involved in the two businesses. But yeah, I wouldn't say one's easy and the other one's hard, but the challenges involved in the two different streams of business are completely separate challenges. With these systems, do you constantly keep having to evolve them? Yes, yeah, certainly. It's it's something that we look at on a daily basis. Our internal motto at Kogan is there is always a better way. And we're constantly optimizing every single process, every single system to ensure that it's everyone else in the market playing catch up rather than us playing catch up. I used to get upset when other companies used to copy what we do. Now, you know, I'm a strong believer in the fact that uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. So our job is to ensure that everyone else is copying us rather than the other way around and the way that you do that is by never resting on your laurels always innovating and ensuring that you're ahead of the eight ball yeah so this if you take the other side of the coin this means that for say a traditional retailer they've got a huge learning curve to to get into and compete with companies like yours Yes, certainly. And that's why if you look at the market in general, you'll see all of our big bricks and mortar retailers, the moment they get online, uh, a few months later, they say, oh, it hasn't been performing as as expected or, you know, online's not the way our online store is doing minimal traffic. uh, Because what they forget is online isn't just a matter of setting up a website, that there's a lot and a lot involved in the background. It's not easy. A perfect example would be Click Frenzy, which happened a few months ago. Kogan was the only retailer in the country whose website stayed up. David Jones went down, Maya went down, Harvey Norman went down, JB Hi-Fi went down, Big W went down, every single retailer because they don't understand online. They don't understand how to scale their systems. They don't understand the technology involved. But hopefully it's just a matter of time and they hire the right people and they get the right expertise on board. And, you know, we love competition. So hopefully one day it'll get to the point where they can compete against Kogan because that'll only drive us even further. So now... The other key, I guess, is customer service. How do you deliver customer service, say, in competition with somebody, say, a bricks and mortar guy who's been and had a look at the Apple store and he's been impressed by that? And yet, how do you deliver the kind of customer, develop the kind of customer relationship that you obviously have got? Yeah, well, customer service is very important to us. We go by the motto that every single customer needs to get first class service and that we cannot afford an upset customer. The reason we can't afford an upset customer is because of the transparency involved online. So say you come along to Kogan, you purchase something and you're upset with your purchase. You can go online, you can go onto a blog, forum, Facebook, Twitter and post a negative message. The next Next person who comes along and thinks, oh, well, should I make a purchase from Kogan? They're going to Google Kogan review. The moment they'll Google that, they'll see your negative comments and they won't make a purchase from us. So I think that because of that transparency, we are forced 
to provide first class service. And, um, you know, it's very, very important because, because look, you, you can't afford to miss out on any sale. But if you look at your bricks and mortar stores, you've got the same guy selling someone a toaster, then a dishwasher, then a bed, then a microwave, then a TV. And they've been preaching service, service, service. That person cannot possibly be an expert at all of those products. We've got staff that are highly trained, that are empowered with Google tool that allow them to find the right answer, to answer the right question immediately. We are so transparent. You could come along to Kogan and you could see what our last million customers thought about a purchase from us. It's all out there. It's available one Google search away. You can read reviews on our site. You can see our feedback, all of that. You, it's There's so much transparency in it. When you walk into a store, you've got no idea what the last thousand customers thought about this salesman. Did he give me accurate advice? Did he provide good service? Was there after sales service? Did the product do what it's meant to do? Uh, was I told all the right things? You know, because there's no transparency there. There's nothing on the record. It's just, um, you know, cowboys going around trying to make their commission for the day saying whatever it takes to make the customer pull their credit card out. Online, there's a full track record of every single comment any of our staff have ever said to a customer. So I would go as far as saying that, yes, there are challenges in service, but the service is much better online. There is more accountability and there's more transparency. So how often, how much training do you have to do for your staff to manage that? Yeah, there's a lot of training that goes into it and we work very hard in automating as much of it as possible because in my opinion the best service is no service now i know that might not that might not sound good but what it actually means is that we want our customers to be able to uh, make a purchase from kogan and understand everything and know about the whole transaction without ever having to ask us a question the moment someone needs to contact us we see that as a problem with our business because our business works or it's all about efficiency it's all about uh, getting things to customers as cheap as possible. So a great example would be um, our customer service staff used to get asked probably 500 times a day, can I please pick up this product? We'd answer them politely and would explain that no, you can't pick up the product uh, due to certain OHS issues at uh, warehouses. We can't allow staff to be driving into our warehouse and carrying products home. Uh, we realized, well, hang on a second. What's better than answering this question to 500 customers really well is to ensure that the customer is informed well enough not to have that question answered. So on top of our listings everywhere, it says, you know, pickup is not available. You can hover your mouse over it and have that question answered for you. And it explains exactly why pickup is not available. So whilst our staff are highly trained and, you know, we've got all these systems and processes in place and manuals and operation manuals, and uh, there's a significant amount of testing that every staff member goes through before they can start working in customer service, uh, the ultimate transaction, say you come and purchase from us, would be one where you never ever have to contact us. You go online, all the information is available there for you. It answers every question you may have. Uh, you make a few clicks, you make the purchase, you receive the user manual uh, in your inbox, you receive a link to an instructional video of exactly how to use the product. The product arrives on time, you receive all the tracking information, it's easy to track, the product arrives, easy to use, you don't need to ask us a question. That, in my opinion, is much better service than having to ask lots of questions and getting good service in return. So we still do that and we still provide excellent service, but our ultimate transaction would be someone who we meet all of their needs and requirements without ever having to manually interact with them. So one of the technologies in a sense that you use is psychology. You need to understand your customer very, very closely, don't you? Definitely, and we spend a lot of time questioning our customers and pr doing surveys and asking them, you know, how can we do better? We'll even send a survey where a person, uh, you know, will reply very highly uh, to all the questions and give us 10 out of 10 for everything, and we'll reply to that and saying, nah, we're not perfect, don't give us 10 out of 10, tell us where we can improve, because we want to know where we can improve, and that's the only way we're gonna keep driving the business forward. An example is, even in, through all the questioning, some of our product developments. A lot of our products come about because of listening to our customers, surveying our customers, but there's even things that we do, like we thought, hang on a second, we can cut the cost of each product by about two or three dollars if we don't uh, print user manuals for the product. Uh, we surveyed our customers, would say, do you really need to receive booklets 
in the box of each product with the user manual or would you prefer us to just put it online? And all the customers replied saying, oh, I never even look at the user manual. I've never touched a user manual in my life. Others said, I check it once in a month. And we thought, well, hang on a second. We're just gonna make it a digital user manual. When you purchase something from us, you'll receive a link to the user manual in your inbox and off you go, you know, saves a few dollars, helps the environment and customers are happier. In a business like this, which is enormously complex, obviously, you must have had good times and bad times. You know, what are some of the problems, uh, you know, are the difficulties with couriers or the line? What, what's your worst experience? And then what's been your best? Problems and difficult times on a daily basis. We make thousands of decisions on a daily basis and think about how we can improve our business. The most important thing is anytime there's a problem, anytime there's a challenge and you solve it, that you use that as a learning experience for moving forward. For instance, I think about one and a half years into Kogan, the Olympic Games were on in, I think it was the Beijing Olympics, so 2008. And um, there was a shipment of TVs that arrived uh, just before the Olympics we sent them out to about a thousand customers and then we learnt after sending them that there was a problem with the soundboard in the TV and the Olympics were just about to start we had to within the space of a few days deploy engineers Australia wide to go to everyone's house to replace the soundboard in every single TV to ensure that they can have a pleasant viewing experience of the Olympics without a single issue with their TV we lost hundreds of thousands of dollars on that shipment of TVs but we learned some lessons that were invaluable or worth millions of dollars to us so because of that we ensured that our quality control procedures were tightened up we now have multiple checks of things at the components level pre-production we have multiple checks during production we have post-production checks we have checks where TVs are tested in 70 degree heat we have checks where TVs are tested in minus 5 degree cool uh, we have have um, much more aging testing so we have implemented so many more checks on every order to ensure that a problem like that could never occur again and what do you know it's never occurred again so yes we lost a few hundred thousand dollars on that order when we had uh, you know a thousand TVs in that order but now our, our orders are you know 10,000 20 30,000 TVs getting manufactured at once and we've never had any similar problems because we've learned a lot from it and in the same way we've got challenges all the time you know our businesses gone very quickly from dispatching uh, 200 items a day to now we're dispatching about 10,000 items a day. The systems you need in place, the architecture, the logistics involved in that is a whole different ball game. So there's been challenges all the way through in everything. Those sort of challenges are what makes business exciting. It's what makes me get up in the morning. Now, one of the big trends, of course, is mobile commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, how are you responding to that? Yeah, well, uh, we were one of the first in Australia to respond. We've had a mobile website for a long time. We knew a long time ago that mobile traffic is going to overtake desktop internet traffic, and it did this year, or it just overtook it, or it's about to. We're seeing about 50% of our traffic come from mobile devices. Now, we were one of the first in Australia about what a year and a half ago where we do mobile a lot differently to others like for instance one of the things we did is we mapped out all of the shopping centers in Australia all the major commerce hubs and we geo targeted ads to people in those locations because we knew people are going to use their mobile phone to compare prices so you see people all the time in stores look at a product they'll say it's 349 they jump on their phone and they go you know because they're thinking should I buy it for 349 right away or should I see how much this product's Worth. They'll do a quick Google search on their phone and they'll go, oh, what the hell? You can get it for $229 online and they walk out of the store. So we specifically geo target locations that have JB Hi Fi's and Harvey Normans and Big W's and Myers. And to ensure that whenever someone in those stores does a search on their phone, the first thing they see is an ad for a Kogan product at a cheaper price. So um, we were doing this a year and a half ago, you know. So we've had to ensure that we stay ahead of the curve and use that technology to our advantage because one of the things we don't do here is we don't ignore innovation we don't ignore industry trends and we don't ignore technological advancement the mar your, your prices are lower that's a result what a volume lower margins there's a few factors that go into it uh, a few of the big factors would be uh, cutting out the middlemen would be the biggest one so we are manufacturer direct to consumer usually products go uh, from a factory to a 
exporter to an importer or from an exporter to an agent to an importer to a distributor to a retailer and then to the customer every single person along the way wants their 10 to 20 percent cut uh, as a result of cutting out four or five middlemen boom straight away we're about 40 percent cheaper uh, then on top of that uh, it's to do with our sourcing uh, it's to do with the fact that uh, we can source products better than others we've got systems in place that create a lot of competition at the supply level we have distributors and suppliers bidding against each other to fulfill our orders whilst other retailers set up exclusive supply arrangements uh, my opinion is the moment you've got an exclusive supply arrangement you become that distributors bitch whatever they do you're obliged to buy it off them at that price and slap your margin on it we create competition amongst distributors and factories all over the world which drives prices down it's also our volume as our business has grown our volume allows us to have cheaper prices Credit Suisse reported yesterday uh, that Kogan's price gap between Dick Smith JB Hi-Fi and Harvey Norman has grown substantially in the last six months. Uh, the reason Credit Suisse reported that is because it's true. The reason it's true is because our volumes have grown considerably. Uh, there's, you know, a lot of other factors involved in it. For instance, the way that uh, we determine what inventory to take on board. Now, a big expense to any retailer is excess stock and selling off stuff that, you know, they made a mistake while purchasing. So they'll take on board 10,000 keyboards because they think keyboards are going to sell really well in the lead up to uh, school the school year starting they'll only sell 5,000 out of the 10,000 then they'll have to sell the other 5,000 below stock uh, below cost price because they didn't predict their stock correctly we use mechanisms which show us exactly how many people are searching what term in Google, which gives us the exact number of products of a certain thing we should take into stock because getting Google search data is like brain to keyboard with no filter. Uh, traditionally, uh, you'll have uh, these big retailers. What they'll do is they'll hire a market research firm. The market research firm will put people around a round table and they'll say, oh, well, what are you looking to buy? One of them will say, yeah, I'm looking to buy a laptop dock. And then the other nine sheep in the room will go yeah I'm also looking to buy a laptop doc and then the market research firm will produce a 600 page report saying people are looking to buy laptop docs then a big retailer will buy that 600 page report for a few million dollars and order thousands of laptop docs whereas we're actual Google stats where what are people actually searching for and we can do it with exact precision we can tell that for each 3094 uh, 32 inch TVs we manufacture we need to manufacture 200 and uh, 2932 or 40 42 inch I can't remember which one I said first but you know we can get it down to a exact science now not having any excess stock means our business runs efficiently means our prices are lower and I could go on for hours about all these little one percenters in our business that give us our price advantage so how often are you checking for Google for this oh, daily, well, we've got full-time people we've got people full-time responsible for um, you know we've got certain tools that give us access to exact Google search data and they're comparing how many people today searched for iPad how many people search for Samsung Galaxy tab how many people search for Samsung Galaxy s3 and that's their job that's their job their job is to analyze market data because it's the most accurate way to see what's in demand you know because there's no it's accurate data it's brain to keyboard with no filter I can tell you leading into Christmas that for you know every Nintendo Wii we take into stock we should have two Xboxes and 1.7 PS3s like I know exactly what's going to sell we never have any excess inventory and that efficiency in our business ensures that we can keep our prices down and you don't you're not selling off excess stock at uh, at a loss we, either are you? we never have excess stock by using an exact science in that in that regard in terms of what inventory to take on board if you become more efficient you never have have excess stock that you're selling below cost which means you're making more money which means that you can reduce your prices further and conversely one of the issues that many bricks and mortar retailers have when they go to becoming an online function is that they run out of stock yeah and uh, you can't do that if you're online exactly so uh, it works in both ways we never have excess stock and we never run out of stock and um, you know that's just that's just you know one of those one percenters another one for instance would be amount of data we have in our business so a bricks and mortar retailer is forced to you know when they fit out their stores and they put stuff around the store they don't know how many people stop to look at this product how many people walked away from this product and things like that we know in our business how many people spend 
it's how many people looked at every single page, which pages made people stay, which pages just made people leave, which pages have a high conversion rate, which pages have a low conversion rate, which pages people land on, which pages are likely to make people transact. We have all of this data and we're constantly optimizing our site. So it would, it would be the equivalent of putting a camera on every customer's head as they walk into a Harvey Norman and then having someone sit there and analyze the data, then call the customer and say, hey, I noticed you walk up to a microwave, but then you turned around quickly and left. Why did you do that? You know, whereas we actually have that information. Another uh, efficiency in the business is our marketing. So all of these bricks and mortar stores, they're spending a lot of money on traditional marketing. And it's a famous quote from traditional marketers where they say, I know 50% of my marketing's working. I just don't know which 50%. On our end, we know what every single cent of our marketing is doing. We know what words people are searching. We know what ads they're clicking, which know which banners they're clicking. We know which words convert, what doesn't convert. We know what every single cent is doing it. And once again, we've got full-time staff who are just sitting out there right now, analyzing that data and optimizing things. What's the process of optimizing? The process of optimizing is looking for the return on investment on each word. So uh, we'll look for instance, and we'll see that someone searching iPad might have a really low conversion rate, but that word might have a really, uh, really high bid on it. So we're paying $4 for to bring someone searching iPad to our site. And we might notice that that's got a really low conversion rate because we don't know what they were looking for. They may have been looking to, um, you know, look for a user manual for an iPad, or they may have been looking how to replace a screen on an iPad, or they may have been looking for an iPad cover or a case or to download some apps. It's so broad, you don't know what they're looking for. So your conversion rate is going to be lower. Whereas someone searching by iPad 4, you go, all right, this is very targeted and it's direct. And we can, because it's a less common term, we can get it for cheaper. That term only costs us $1.50 per click, but the conversion rate on that one is 4.8%, whereas the conversion rate on the other one was 0.3%. So we'll say, let's lower our bids on the other ones. Let's raise our bids on these ones. So it's looking at the return on investment on every single keyword one by one and seeing what the actual stats show and then saying the words that are more likely to convert people into customers raise the bids these words are more important to us the words that are less likely to convert people into customers lower the bid and then you take it one level further and you look at the return on investment on that word so for instance we do sell a lot of iPad cases but uh, our iPad cases cost like $19 so if it costs $6 to buy the word buy iPad case. And yes, it might be converting really well, but we'll be going, hang on a second, it's converting well, but we're spending $6 to get $19 of revenue. Uh, that's too much return. That That's too much of an expense. Let's lower the bids on those words. So there's a lot of there's a lot of things that it churns through. But the beautiful thing is we have all of that data. We have the processes in place. We can make those decisions quickly. We base the decisions not on emotions and a gut feel. We base it on real actual data. Whereas traditional marketers will be like, oh yeah, I reckon that ad we ran on channel seven worked. They'll have no data to suggest that it worked. There's no way to measure whether it worked or not. But just because they had a gut feel that it worked, they'll spend millions of dollars running that ad on channel seven. So, um, you know, we're all about data, facts, and actual real information. I sometimes joke that we're a statistics business masquerading as an online retailer. Statisticians would be essential to your business, yeah. aren't they? Yeah, definitely. We do a lot of statistical analysis and a lot of statistical work in our business, and we have hired statisticians to perform a lot of the tasks that I just described. And data analysis. Yeah. So this is a long way from the day that Ruslan Kogan set out on this journey, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. You know, when... I went to start this business six years ago. It was just based on a few factors that I knew online retail was going to be big. I knew that there's a gap in the market with TVs. I had no money in the bank at the, at that time and I knew I could run a pre-sale to, you know, and it'd be a compelling story to customers. Buy something for $1,000 that cost $3,000 elsewhere. There's been a lot of developments in the business. It's been a very exciting uh, learning curve. I haven't slept a lot in the last six years, uh, but I jump out of bed every morning to, you know, get into this business because I love doing it. And there's a lot of room still for for you in in this business yeah look we're just getting started um this is this is just the start of it. We're 250 mil at the moment. The consumer electronics industry in Australia is 10 billion. So we're, that's what, that's 2.5%. Yeah, we're, 
we're just getting started. That said, if current industry trends continue, if our growth continues and the others slow down at the rate that they've been slowing down, we'll be the biggest consumer electronics retailer in Australia within four years. Russell and Kogan, it sounds very exciting and we thank you for your time. Thank you. Well, Leon, I found that absolutely riveting. I'm not sure I'm going into online retailing, but if I ever did, that's a real primer. That's the best advice you could possibly ever get. I hope everyone listens to it and takes it on board because I think what he said was really, really valuable. And remember to be with us a fortnight from now because we have Neil Campbell of Dimension Data, which is uh, now owned by NTT in Japan. It's a global company and it's fascinating. Uh, And he's going to talk about um, security online, BYOD and things like that. And Neil, of course, was uh, formerly a member of the Australian Federal Police, a specialist in internet security. Absolutely. And it's a fascinating interview. You'll love it. In the meantime, you can tune in to us on Twitter at Talking Tech TEC or you can follow us on Facebook. And we look forward to being back to you in two weeks' time. And we'll see you then.